Hi, Alison here. I thought I'd talk to you today about metaphor and recovery. And by metaphor, that rather highfalutin word, what I mean is the kind of stories that we tell ourselves and the imagery that we use to describe where we are in our life and what's happening to us. And I want to start talking a little bit about my own personal experience of illness and the metaphors I used back in those times um, and how that connects into what I see with other people around me now with clients uh, and, and other people I know who've been through the recovery process. So back in 2019 I talked a lot about being stuck in a long dark tunnel and that sometimes lights would appear I would think that that was the exit of the tunnel and it was always an oncoming train. And this is a story I told to myself and to other people again and again and again. And another one I used was a tsunami. I felt that I was just experiencing hit after hit after hit of awful circumstances, bereavements and illness and crises that I was having to try and cope with on my behalf and for my family, my children. And there was no breathing space between one and the next. And this tsunami was just completely overwhelming me and I couldn't see an end to it. In fact, whenever things seemed to calm down, I was just waiting for the next the next wave. And at that time, I was really struggling health wise. I'd had to give up my work. My brain fog was so bad that I was forgetting names, which is really not good in a volunteer coordinator. I was missing appointments. I had such pain in my feet that I couldn't drive anymore. And I'd reached the stage um, where I was going up and down the stairs on my backside because I couldn't stand. I was I was dizzy and uncomfortable and going up. My chest pounded. So I tended to go up again, either sitting down or hands and knees, just one step at a time. And when I looked down at my feet, my ankles were thickened and I thought, my God, I look like an old woman of 80. And my ankles didn't work anymore. I Part of the reason why I couldn't go downstairs easily was that instead of my ankles moving freely in all dimensions as they should do, they'd become a hinge and they were just doing that. And that was in a response to my immobility because of the pain. I stopped using my feet properly. And so they actually responded by atrophying and, and stiffening. And so I talked as well at the time that life had passed me by. That, that was it I was finished I'd just turned 50 and I was thinking well even if I do finally reach recovery I'm going to be so close to retirement that what am I going to be able to do with the rest of my life this is pretty much it and it was really hard to keep the hope alive with these kind of images going through my mind and that's something that I hear a lot the tunnel the tsunami this sort of sense of time ticking by as well another another metaphor and that's something I see not only in people of my own age, which is very commonly when these illnesses happen, but also in younger clients where it's subtly different. There's still this sense of is this whole life's ever going to be and it's passing me by. But it's that tick, tick, tick of the biological clock. If I don't get well soon, I'm not going to be able to have a family. I'm going to miss out on that. I'm not going to be able to have a career. I'll miss out on that. And again, the same thing by the time I'm well, if I'm ever well, what can I do with my life? And you spiral with all of these imagery images further and further down into despair. Another one that I used, and again and again, I see in other people, is a sense of being trapped. People talk about being trapped a lot. I had a sense almost of having one of those ancient gin trap things around my feet. And the more I struggled, the more painful it got. And I remember that particularly feeling very powerful in 2020 during the pandemic. Now, I had left Scotland 20 years before then, very much against my will for economic reasons. We were following work and I'd always wanted to go back again. And then during the pandemic, I remember seeing an image of a police car up on Carter Bar on the border, patrolling the border because legally people couldn't move from England into Scotland and vice versa. And I remember feeling almost physically that trap coming down on me that even if I was well enough, I would no longer be allowed into Scotland. And it felt so final, even though I knew it, it, it wouldn't be. It was a devastating feeling at the time. And one that persisted. 
And if we think about these kind of stories that we tell ourselves, the images that, that, that come along with them, they're so, so dark, they tend to sort of funnel us in into a state of really high anxiety. And what happens when we're anxious is we go into the fight or flight response. And I talk about this and the impact that it has right the way across your body in my video on the domino effect. But actually those images, that thinking, feeds your symptoms and makes them worse. And then we've got another imagery of this great big cycling down this spiral or whirlpool down into despair. And I'm not saying that these images aren't valid, that they don't describe how you feel at that time. But I think it's really important, if you can, to step back and recognise that they are not real. They are just ways of describing the feeling and that there are other ways. And one of the really important things within recovery is to gradually learn and be supported to change the way you talk, the way you think, the way you frame things, and to be very conscious of the power of the images that you choose and what it does to you. Fight or flight narrows our responses. That's a physiological thing. As animals under threat, our attention span has to focus on the source of that threat. And what that does in addition to feeding your symptoms with all the adrenaline and everything, is it means that you can't see the possibilities. So when you're stuck in that long, dark tunnel and you're so focused on looking for the, for the light at the end of the tunnel, you can't actually see possibly other exits or, or opportunities that come up. Or when you see an opportunity that comes up, you may be so sucked down into despair that you actually dismiss it, say, oh, it won't work. So you can see how this, this narrowing down can be really, really quite dangerous in keeping you stuck. And I remember the day that my own imagery of that being lost in a tunnel actually evaporated and disappeared. And I'd been working with a practitioner who was challenging some of the ways that I was talking. And I can remember thinking about that long, dark tunnel and suddenly thinking, well, maybe I could just dig upwards. And it might have been also because I'm playing a lot of Minecraft, which my children got me into. And I'm spending a lot of time digging uh, digital as well as metaphorical tunnels. But what it did was in my imagination, it made me look up and I suddenly thought, there's light up there. I missed that. I just hadn't noticed it. And suddenly I could see light in the darkness and it was very small glimmers of light. So it was a bird singing outside my window as I was stuck in bed, or the silver lining on the clouds that were scudding by, or it was the, the light of the love that my husband brought me when he brought me a cup of tea in the morning, or the, the light and the joy of watching comedy programmes together when we were feeling down and it lifted us up, and the light and the hugs of my children. And I suddenly realised that I didn't have to reach the end of that tunnel for there to be joy and light every day. And that while I was aiming for full recovery, recovery is a process and that I could actually have that light right now. And that that was a choice. It was a choice to step away from the dark imagery and to look at something else. Uh, and I know we talk a lot about gratitude at the chrysalis effect. It doesn't make everything go away straight away, but it makes life bearable. And when you've got those little glimmers of light in each day, it gives you the energy and the direction to keep moving forward, however slowly, towards the end of that tunnel. And I want to talk as well a little bit about how we respond when we are in that fear place, when we are trapped in that dark tunnel. And by their very nature, chronic exhaustive conditions are very isolating. So we can no longer get out and do things. We're stuck in the house much more in many cases. But also friends tend to slide away because we don't see them as, as often. They sort of tend to stop including us in, in their plans. Some friends and family even will disappear because you're no longer useful to them. And that's really, really painful. And you're left on your own. And there is a natural urge, I think, to not feel this sense of you're on your own and nobody understands. 
because you can be in a crowded room and feel that nobody understands when you have one of these conditions. They don't know what it's like to really be tired or to be in pain all day, every day, and to feel that your life is finished. So there is this natural tendency to cluster. And many of us, when we have a diagnosis, sometimes even before, are advised to go and join a support group. There are some really good support groups out there. And if you are a part of one of those, then hang on to it. And that is wonderful. But there are also very many which are actually quite dangerous places to be in when you're ill. And the reason is that they are spaces in which people are gathering together just to know that they're not alone, but they reinforce the darkness. They rehearse the symptoms, the illness, the you know all of the awful things about it, the, the applications for PIP payments. And so you're actually not doing anything outside of being a patient and being miserable. And it reminds me sometimes of listening to elderly relatives in the past who would say, oh, my knee today is awful. And the other one would say, oh, well, you know, you've got knee pain, but oh, my constipation. And then it would be, well, you're on one center card. Well, I'm on two. I get this one upmanship and it, it just gets worse and worse and worse. And back then I used to sort of smile at it. But this was what I was seeing. And the one occasion that I did go to a support group, it was people were just upping the ante and and comparing symptoms and there was nothing else to life. And they were cementing themselves in this dark, sp stuck space. And for me, what was even more frightening in that particular group is there was a man in the middle of it, a whole group of women, one man in the middle. And what he was doing was encouraging them to pay him for advice on filling out their PIP forms, which they all saw as a service. And you might see it in, in a positive light as that, but it was in his interest to keep going this fear, this focus on symptoms, because that meant that the money kept flowing into him. And I left that particular support group absolutely terrified because I had seen for the first time people who were in wheelchairs with their fibromyalgia. And I was thinking, I really, I can't, I can't end up my life like that. Um, but I don't know how to stop it. But I could sense this, this whirlpool sucking down so that there was nothing more to life than symptoms and cannabis oils um, and medications. And, and what, what were you taking now? And I can contrast that now with the community that I am a part of now with the chrysalis effect, and it's a community of recoverers. And support is incredibly important if you are to recover. The recovery is a hard journey and very, very, very difficult to do on your own. And yet there is this tendency, I think, for many of us to feel that we can do it on our own, that we should, and that we just push through and do it. The people who recover engage with others around them and they take the support that's available and the dis difference within the chrysalis effect community is that we keep it positive and supportive so yes people talk about their symptoms they talk about the awful things that happens to them and sometimes they will compare medications and that sort of thing but the overall um, atmosphere of the group is encouragement it's about what's working so somebody might say, I'm really struggling with this, but because it's a mixed group of people at all different stages of recovery and people like myself who are fully recovered will come in and say, have you tried this? Or I noticed you said this. How about if you twisted it around? So there is a constant building and movement. Everybody is moving together at lots of different paces, but the focus is always on recovery and not stuckness. And I see that really as my role in the work that I'm doing, having been through that long, dark tunnel and found my way out with help from other people who've recovered, is that I am one of those people who can now go back into the darkness, but armed with a torch and a map and say, OK, I'm here. Let's walk out of this together. And I can guide people through the shortcuts 
and help them to avoid the pit holes and just hold that light for them so they can keep the hope going that they are going to reach the outside at some point but also to help them find the joy in every day and those little specks of, of light and I am profoundly grateful for those practitioners who I worked with who helped me to find my way out and to shift my ways of think thinking and I'm just going to finish with a couple of images here which are returning to that, that constant theme, that imagery of moving from the darkness to the light. And if you look um, on this first image, it's a shading. It's a shading from the dark to the light. And you might see it as it's very densely packed black dots on the left that gradually get further apart until on the right, it's almost completely white. And that I would see very much as the metaphor for the recovery journey is that we are moving. So rather than sitting on that left hand side, we might see this as a field or the, or, or the tunnel, I suppose, going back to that, sitting in the dark of that tunnel on the left. If you sit still with other people, you're never actually going to get anywhere. You will be there for the rest of your life unless you do something about it. And if you stick with those people who need you to stay there with them, you'll stay there you won't see any opportunities you won't make any movement however if you start even one tiny step tiny step a day moving towards that paler side the light on the right you will gradually get there but what you'll also notice is that there are more of those little white dots appearing around you more of those little moments of joy and hope and as you progress there are more and more of those so if we move on, I've added this green squiggly line, and this is supposed to represent the recovery journey. And the recovery journey is never a straight trajectory. Everybody wants it to be. It would be fabulous if it was. But it always involves times when the symptoms get worse and we have a dip and we stop doing the things we need to do that, that, that we know make us better. And then we come back again and we go a little bit further. But the trajectory is always up in these little waves. And as you move across that field of dots from the dark to the light, the dark speckles actually become fewer and further between. And the dips in your sy symptoms become less severe and further apart until eventually you emerge on the right hand side there out into the light. I will add a caveat here that being recovered, when I talk about being recovered, it's important to understand that life is never perfect. So the fact that I have recovered from fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue doesn't mean that bad things don't happen. So I've had COVID, I've had urine infections, I've had bereavements, um, and they were unpleasant, but I got through them. And I got through them because as I made that journey, my recovery journey, I learned how to think differently how to change the way I frame the world, the stories I told myself. And those enabled me to behave differently and to make changes in my life and to really embed those changes so that even if I begin to slip back a little bit and stop looking after myself, I notice really quickly and I do something about it. So I now am confident that I am never going to go back into that dark place again. And so within the chrysalis effect framework, what we mean by full recovery is that you have had a full 12 months with none of the symptoms of your diagnosis. And that all of those changes are really embedded and are a natural part of your routines of your daily life and not things that you have to work out through willpower. So I hope that's been really helpful and that maybe you might after having listened to this, just spend a little bit of time thinking about what imagery do you use when you think about your illness and your recovery? Do you tend to think about tsunamis and whirlpools and traps and tunnels? And when you have those images in your head, how does it make you feel? What does your energy do? And where do you feel it in your body? And just take a little bit of time with that. And then move on. and. See if you can reframe it into something more positive. What more positive imagery is that? 
And an example in language of that might be the difference between saying, oh, I can't come out with you tonight because I'm just too exhausted and I'm really ill. Or saying, I'm not going to come out tonight because I'm actually working on my recovery and I don't want to set myself back, but maybe next time. And sit with that different wording, that different imagery and notice then, how do you feel? What does your energy do? How do you feel that in your body and compare? And maybe begin to reflect on that and just notice as you go through your days, which spaces you're in so that you can gradually begin shifting from that dark, dark space into the light again. If you found this video helpful, please do click on like below and subscribe to my channel. You might also like to hop across using the links to my Facebook or LinkedIn pages where you'll find much more content.